during the recent war in Afghanistan. He details his efforts to catch the al-Qaeda leader in the new book, Jawbreaker. This talk from Dutton's Beverly Hills Books in California is an hour. I'd like to welcome you to Dutton's Beverly Hills Bookstore. If, after looking at newspapers, blogs, TV, news, talk shows, and shuffling through the spin of the current administration, you s you're still wondering why the U.S. missed their chance to capture Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan, you really must read Jawbreaker. It has two authors. The first is Ralph Pizzullo, who is, listen to this, a poet, an award-winning playwright, a screenwriter, a TV writer, a mystery writer, and the author of the nonfiction books At the Fall of Somoza and Plunging into Haiti. Then there is the man whose experience this book elucidates, the CIA's key field commander, one of its most decorated officers, who, with his paramilitary training coordinated the fight against the Taliban forces and the drive to get Osama bin Laden dead or alive. Gary Bernson. I hope he will tell you how the CIA blocked some information in this book, even though it has already been disseminated in other publications. I love the way their censoring is handled in Jawbreaker. It remains blocked out. <laughs> I'm sure you'll hear more about that. I must say, Jawbreaker is a superlative read, as good and as well written as any action suspense thriller you care to name. Since we're here in Beverly Hills, I will say that Jawbreaker would make a terrific Hollywood movie, but for only one element. The villain gets away. <laughs> Find out how this could have happened by reading Jawbreaker. It's my pleasure to present Gary Brinson and Ralph Pizzullo. It is a pleasure to be with you all tonight. First thing I want to say is, is the mission in Afghanistan was mine and the men that were with me. This book is Gary Bernstein and Ralph Pizzullo. It is the combined efforts of the two of us. I am so grateful to Ralph Pizzullo for his efforts. He is a fabulous writer. He taught me so much in writing this book. And I know that many of you here do know Ralph, that you've had experiences with Ralph and you know every thing that I'm saying, and, and I know many of you recognize Ralph's great talents. So, uh, you know, I would, I, would, I would really like to say that, uh, again, thank you to my co-author for everything he did for me in helping me write this book. I am proud of the work that we did together, and uh, there is other projects that we're going to do together as well. Thanks, thank, you. thank you. I just want to say that it's been a privilege working with Gary. He's a, he's a true American hero. Uh, read the book and you'll find out. I mean, this is a really an amazing man. Uh, the, the, the whole story behind this book is, is a movie unto itself. Uh, I got an email from Gary in, in May of 2004. And uh, it, it, uh, it's been an incredible process. We ended up, you know, having to sue the CIA, and uh, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's been uh, it's been pretty amazing. But uh, uh, I hope you read the book and enjoy it. And and it's been it's been really a, a privilege uh, to work with Gary. Thank you. You want to? Oh, sorry. <laughs> you're, you're gonna, Can you hear us? Can you hear us in the back? Yeah. Yeah. Up to where? You're gonna read. Right there. Okay. All right. So Gary is going to read uh, a section first, 
and then I'm going to read a section from the book, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Can you hear me now? Okay. How's that? Yeah, Can you hear me in the back now? Perfect. Okay, fine. I'm going to read a passage which begins in Tajikistan, uh, in, in, in the capital of Tajikistan, Doshanbe, uh, the night we lifted off and took a helicopter into the mountains uh, as we were proceeding uh, on our mission after uh, 11 September. It's important to understand that uh, 15 months before 11 September, I and five other men entered Afghanistan uh, with the Northern Alliance in an effort to capture or kidnap one of bin Laden's key lieutenants. Uh, unfortunately, uh, those in Washington uh, didn't have the stomach for it and pulled us out early. Uh, so. After 11 September, knowing that I was a Persian linguist, knowing that I had been involved in these things before, I knew Afghanistan, I knew the Afghan commanders, I was selected to lead the team in for what would be the combat phase of the uh, conflict in Afghanistan. Uh, this passage uh, starts once we load onto a MH-47 helicopter and we enter Afghanistan. As soon as we lifted off, I pulled a wool hat over my head and got out my heavy leather gloves. The crew snapped down their night vision equipment as the light inside the cabin was shut. It was going to be a cold, dark flight. As we climbed past 14,000 feet, one of the crew members handed me an oxygen mask tethered to a long, hard cord. I took a deep breath and passed it down the line to Amir, then Hamid, then the crew member and back. We had to take turns to avoid hypoxia. Ta Todd and the guy sitting opposite passed a second mask. Approximately 30 minutes into the flight, the engines strained to pass through snow-covered peaks, some top to 20,000 feet. I figured we had to be flying at an altitude of at least 16,000 feet. I wondered to myself, how high can this baby go? Through a headset, I followed communications between the crews of the two MH-47s. The second one was struggling with the weight of the team's gear. The pilot said he was going to drop some fuel. I knew this wasn't good. The Taliban controlled most of the territory uh, they were flying over, and we had to stop. And if, if we had to stop in the event of an emergency, we were screwed. A year earlier, after a four-week siege, the Taliban had captured the city of Talakan in Afghanistan's northeastern Takar, Takar province. Talakan had served as the Northern Alliance's temporary capital. Our now dead ally, General Ahmed Shah Massoud, had been forced to retreat over the Khwaja Mohammed Mountains into Badakhshan. More than 150,000 people had been displaced. I turned to Amir and Hamid, both of whom were new officers and had never been deployed on an operation of any kind. Now they were taking part in one of the most dangerous and, and important missions in CIA history. We're in this fight together, I told Amir, holding up my right fist. The Arab American responded with the same gesture. So did Hamid. Both men looked nervous. Once they were on the ground, I said to myself, I'm going to pair each with a military, a paramilitary officer so they don't get killed. Out the portal window, I saw the other CH-47 with Hank and Vice Admiral Callan flying parallel to us, 200 meters away. Beyond the second helicop helicopter was a backdrop of stars, snow-capped mountains, and a half moon. My mind raced ahead. The brutal Taliban was waiting. I'd seen film footage of how they treated their own people. Women driven in the back of pickups into stadiums packed with cheering Islamic fundamentalists. They were taken out and led by leashes attached to their bound hands, forced to their knees in the center of the stadium and shot through the back of the heads one by one. I knew that shortly after the predominantly Pashtun Taliban occupied Kabul in September 1996, they broadcast 16 decrees over Radio Sharia prohibiting music, shaving, raising of pigeons, narcotics, kite flying, gambling, product reproductions of pictures, British and American style haircuts, charging interest on loans, washing clothes on riverbanks, dancing at weddings, and women leaving their homes without burqas. Their goal was to recreate a society like the one the Prophet Muhammad had lived in on the Arabian Peninsula during the 17th century. According to their fundamentalist worldview, debate was heresy and doubt was sin. 
I thought about my wife and kids, my childhood in Long Island, and the funerals of the dead from the World Trade Center attacks, some of which took place in the same neighborhoods where I grew up. This section has to do with, <clears throat> after the f fall of, uh, of the capital, Kabul, which happened very quickly and which Gary uh, engineered, um, <clears throat> Gary sent a team. Uh, the, the U.S. military did not want to go south because the south was controlled by the Pashtun tribe. The Northern Alliance were Tajiks and Uzbeks. And uh, the U.S. military, as I said, uh, Gary asked the U.S. military for help going south because they were tra tracking bin Laden into the south of, uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, the U.S. military said, it's too dangerous. We're, there's no way we're going down there. So Gary sent a team of, of his people. Uh, they tracked, they went down to Jalalabad, and then they, they tracked uh, Osama bin Laden to the White Mountains, an area called Tora Bora. And uh, uh, this team was called uh, Jawbreaker Juliet, and, and this, is a, this is their story. The four men from Jawbreaker Juliet returned with the dead from Bob Rock Security Detachment, then turned around and humped back into the mountains with their mules. Ahead of them lay large trails and even roads, which they avoided for fear of being detected by an enemy that outnumbered them by at least 100 to 1. Bob Rock's guides knew exactly where to go, leading them through a primitive agricultural area towards a valley high in the mountains nestled between two sharp sets of peaks. Parker, Dusty, Lance, and Reno were at 10,000 feet and counting. With increasing frequency, they stopped to examine hilltops through their binoculars and scopes. Climbing into the thinning oxygen for two days, they stopped at a bluff overlooking a valley with small villages and primitive farms. Bob Rock's guides pointed to a military camp built into the encampment, where they spotted trucks, houses, command posts, checkpoints, machine gun necks, nests, an obstacle course, and hundreds of bin Laden's men. Bingo, Parker exclaimed. Carefully, they, they moved their mules out of sight and established a position behind rocks and some scrawny trees where they couldn't be seen. They instructed the 10 Afghan guides to stay below and defend possible avenues of approach. Parker wasted no time establishing communications with both George and me. I'm ready to establish SATCOM and start calling, jo st start calling in JDAMs, he said excitedly. We gave him a big thumbs up. Meanwhile, Dusty and Lance hauled their, the, the gear they needed, including weapons and ammunition, to the observation point. There, they set the SOFLAM on its tripod, and Reno, the combat controller, dialed up his radio and established communications with an, with an AWACS. We'll have bombers in 30 minutes, he announced. Parker reported to me and George. We're set up and ready to begin. Dusty and Lance peered through the SOFLAM's rubberized scope. The accompanying wire and trigger were tested and ready. The spindly looking contraption could fire a laser as far as 10,000 meters and mark a target for incoming smart munitions. Reno picked up a device that looked like a gigantic palm pilot, which he used to insert coordinates and provide additional guidance to incoming aircraft. As a combat controller, his job was essentially that of an air traffic controller for combat missions. Thunder Juliet, Reno said over the radio to airplanes above, the coordinates are north 363911 east 0666875, 6 elevation 11,298 feet. After receiving a, port from, a report from the pilot, he turned to Dusty and Lance and said, three minutes, two minutes. They lit up the targets, 30 seconds. A great arrow-shaped missile zoomed by, screeching like a car in high gear. A loud explosion shattered the quiet and echoed through the mountains. Scrapnel burned through the air. Before the Al-Qaeda Al soldiers knew what hit them, smart bombs from a B-1 B started thundering around them, throwing trucks in the air and ripping apart buildings and bunkers. Dusty, Lance, Reno, and Parker watched the pandemonium below as Al-Qaeda soldiers tried to reorganize, seek cover, and attend to their wounded all at once. This wasn't a faceless enemy as portrayed in movies or TV, but real fresh and flesh and blood soldiers suffering a grisly death. Working nonstop, the four men directed strike after strike by B-1s, B-2s, and F-14s onto the Al-Qaeda encampment with incredible precision. 
Somehow, through the massive bureaucracy, thousands of miles of distance, reams of red tape, and a diffuse system of command that had, had been hastily assembled and never used before, the U.S. had managed to place four of the most skilled men in the world above the mother load of Al-Qaeda, with a laser designator and communication systems linked to the most potent air power in history. Al-Qaeda soldiers who once dreamed of wrecking havoc on, havoc on the West were now paying with their lives. As I listened over our encrypted radio network, one word kept pounding in my head, revenge. I thought, let's do this right and finish them off in the mountains. Thank you. Uh, uh, we'll, now we'll take questions. I'm going to ask you the yeah. first question because okay. everyone is always too shy <laughs> to be the one. So my, my question really to, to Gary, I suppose, is that during the um, Democratic Convention, the, the last one, um, John Kerry talked about the, um, the uh, uh, search for Osama bin Laden as being outsourced. Would you comment on that? Sure. Um, Senator Kerry's statement was that the uh, United States government, Senator Kerry's statement was that the United States government had completely outsourced or had outsourced the effort to, to kill, kill uh, bin Laden, which was not accurate. Uh, in reality, the CIA had a team go in first, then followed by a special forces team, and we created a triangle, a large triangle, where we were doing airstrikes for almost 16 days, followed by Delta Force, 40 men from Delta Force. Now, I did request the introduction of ground forces in early December, which did not come. So Senator Kerry's statements were... were um, were not cor his criticism was not correct because it wasn't exact. He did not understand what had happened on the ground. It wasn't outsourced. As a CIA officer, I worked for the President of the United States and was conducting that because I understood what his will was. There was a mistake, though, by the administration because they should have insisted that the military put U.S. forces on the ground because I had asked for that. So neither Senator Kerry's statement nor the President's response really accurately portrayed the reality that happened on the ground. It was for me, as the commander watching it, kind of confusing, <laughs> you know, watching the debate, because I didn't think that it was being addressed accurately. And I think part of it, too, is, is it's, you know, there's the fog of war as well. You know, there are a lot of people that have made statements that said, well, you know, the administration wanted bin Laden to get away as a justification, can, can, as a justification to continue the war on terrorism. That's not true. The president was clear. Find him, kill him. And that's what we were trying to do. And, uh, it, but there were mistakes made. We should have introduced troops as, as requested, and that didn't happen. But Secretary Rumsfeld did call the military. There's another book called CENTCOM, and he said, insert soldiers. And CENTCOM didn't want to. Yes, sir. First of all, the campaign, there's a lot of baloney going around. You had Delta Force, you had Behind that, you had special forces. Special forces first. At first, uh, how would you have introduced ground uh, soldiers, soldiers to the ground? I mean, how would they manage the mountains and the there, dangers? There would have been enough space in the early part of the month. The when the initial contact occurred in a place called Millawa, there was still enough space to drop them behind. With each preceding day, or with helicopters, or there were ways to get them in. Uh, several different ways to get them in. We had control of an airfield in Jalalabad where we could have brought in the first group in C-130s. There were several different ways they could have brought them in. In the early part of December, it would have been possible to get them in. But as, as time passed and as Al-Qaeda fell further and further and deeper into the mountains, it became more difficult. It required rapid and immediate intervention when we made that request, and that didn't happen. And just lastly, the, the military installations that, the, that they had, that the Al-Qaeda had in the middle of nowhere in the mountains, how, how are they completely unsophisticated? Did they have any communications? Did they have any... Interesting question. I was shocked by how unsophisticated. You know, at one point we picked up a radio off of a dead Al-Qaeda fighter, and it was a push-to-talk, unencrypted radio that hunters use or your kids would use. And that's what they were using at that point. 
<laughs> but you know, as people fall back and as they're desperate and as they're being attacked and killed, pandemonium occurs. And people don't get to use their best gear or their best gear gets destroyed. You know, all sorts of things happen. You know, most plans in war, you know, are, you know, they stay on plan until contact with the enemy and then everything, you know, falls apart. And they were in, they were falling back, they were in chaos because we were attacking them very rapidly. They never expected that right after the capital would fall that we would be right upon them. And that's what we did. And, and, and uh, uh, the, the, actually, interestingly, the man who picked up the radio is, is, a, is an Arab American, a Muslim American. Uh, and happens to be the man who listens to bin Laden. Whenever there's a tape of bin Laden, he's the man who listens to him and identifies his voice. So he picks up this radio and he starts listening and he hears them talking about the sheik. Is the sheik okay? The sheik's mad. Uh, uh, the America, how did the Americans get here so quickly? And suddenly he hears bin Laden's voice come over <coughs> the radio. Oh yeah. He was there. And they were listening to bin Laden. The, the battle went on for, for two weeks, uh, basically. And they were listening to bin Laden the whole time. So troops would have just allowed you to form a perimeter and not allow anybody On the back it. side. Right. Because we, had, we were below a mountain range. So we could do a half moon below it. The Pakistanis would eventually come up on the back side, but I wanted to drop troops in between bin Laden and the border to block his escape. 130 of the Al-Qaeda members were captured when they crossed into Pakistan by the frontier force. Bin Laden was able to escape through another route after having paid off among the tribes. And those, the hundred first thirty, were captured in Guantanamo. Yes, ma'am. I have two questions. One is, was, was any of this a violation of international law? And the second question is, do you know when we went from being supporters of the Taliban? I don't know how long you've been in the CIA, but I'm interested in the shift from when we were supporting the Taliban to when okay. against the Soviets to when we... We never supported the Taliban. We supported members of the Mujahideen which would eventually be tribes that eventually would form the Northern Alliance. So we, f we, we helped people like Massoud, and we helped people, uh, you know, like uh, all the different tribal leaders fight the Soviets. They then, after the Soviets left in the early 90s, conducted this savage civil war against each other. Pakistan created, supported the Taliban using their weapons. One second. The Saudis provided funding to the Taliban and they seized control of the country. We never supported the Taliban, ever, ever. And then the other question. And the other question was, was any of the mission a violation of you? No, it was it was combat. These are individuals that 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 declared war on us, that attacked us in the United States, and uh, you know were firing at us from the moment we entered the country. Uh, what are you talking about before September? You mentioned something happened before September. Oh, when we entered. Uh, well, in, in 19, we entered in, in 19, uh, actually in 2000, the year 2000, to try to capture one of bin Laden's lieutenants. He had declared war on us. He had blown up our embassies in East Africa. I was the leader of CIA's team that responded to those destroyed embassies and was involved in the capture with the FBI when they said that they had you know, worked for bin Laden. And then bin Laden eventually, there would be tape on him talking about his support to these activities. So uh, we, we felt like we had enough rights to pursue him at that point. Yes, ma'am. I, I imagine, this may not be true, this may be for movies or television, but I imagine there's some kind of debriefing process that happens after something like this. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Great question. Um, I returned from Afghanistan um, just before Christmas, went into the building. I had a 30-minute meeting with the DDCI, the number two man, and the DDO. For, he participated for 10 minutes, and then I left went back to Latin America, and they didn't speak to me again for almost eight months when I was debriefed by the history staff. Uh, so, Is that unusual in your um, Yeah, a little bit unusual. Um, I, I would have thought that there would have been, but you know, part of the problem was, was events were moving so rapidly. Uh, you know, they thought that everyone thought that they understood what happened on the ground, why they won. There's a lot of people in the CIA that would be, well, they would learn a little bit by reading the book. Uh, you know, you can only write up so many things in your daily reports because so many events are happening and, and, and you don't encapsulate it all. But a year later, the history staff did a full debriefing of me and they wrote a study within the agency, for, for eyes only in the agency, about what happened. And, and I was one of the four principles that were written up on that study. So it sounds like from what you're saying that you never were given any kind of resolution around the confusion that we all 
kind of were, were experiencing from a distance, you right in the center of it also did not get any clarity or resolution about what, 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 what what's what um, what actually provided the uh, the impetus for stopping killing him. Well, there was no effort to stop the assault. I mean, the decision was made not to provide ground tr troops. I understand that still I, to this I, I day. never understood why. I was not in the meetings. That was a call by the military, but we made the recommend. I made the re recommendation in the field. The agency made the recommendation in Washington, but, and, and uh, DOD decided not to do it. So I'm just asking, like, as a human being, you have to resolve that on your own, I guess. When you're, I mean, that's so heavy. I would think to resolve that on your own versus getting some answers about why you weren't empowered in that yeah, way. You know, I, only those key people in in DOD know why they made those decisions, and. Um, I know what I did on the ground. I understood what my responsibilities were and attempted to fulfill them as fully as I could. And uh, you know, the rest of it will be um, left up to history. Yeah. Let, me, let me add uh, one thing, and that is that <clears throat> in the middle of this, uh, while the, the Battle of Tora Bora was going on, uh, at the, uh, just before Christmas of 2001, uh, Gary, in the, in the middle of, 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 of managing the war, got a message from headquarters uh, basically saying uh, there's coming there's somebody coming in a few days to relieve you uh, thank you for your your great work uh, you can now return to your post in South America and uh, of course this came as like a huge shock to him and and a huge disappointment to the men on his team who said you know uh, we came here to fight with you uh, the, the reason that they relieved them at that particular time was some kind of bureaucratic nonsense that was going on in Washington uh, this particular man who was relieving Gary, while Gary was in the field fighting the war, this man was campaigning in Washington in headquarters to get the job. Uh, but once he showed up, you know, he had no, he didn't want to fight, and uh, and the and the the fight basically ended when when Gary left. But it just shows you, kind of the bureaucratic, you know, somebody's out in the field fighting, and meanwhile there's all kinds of other bureaucratic stuff that's going on in Washington that. Uh, you know, if you're in the field, you, you, you're not privy to. Yes, sir. As I understand it, they were aware of it. You, you uh, let them know your intention to write this. Um, and uh, But once it was written, all of a sudden, their position became quite different. Yeah, I you know, announced to the agency that I was writing the book. Before I even started writing the book, I said I was going to write a book. Uh, told them. Uh, no, I told them I was in agency. I was going to write a book, and they said, "Fine. Here are the following rules." And I proceeded writing it, and then, of course, I came time to when the book was finished, and they said, "Well, if you're going to stay, we're not going to allow you to remain in service if you're publishing that." So I said, "Okay. Well, I'll retire then. I'll take an early retirement." And then, of course, when I turned the book in, it's a 30, usually a 30-day process. Uh, many years ago, there was a case uh, on the what's called the Marchetti case for a book called *The Cult of Intelligence*. A federal judge ordered the agency to do it all in 30 days, the review. Well, they had my book 95 days the first time they had it, and then redacted massive portions of it. I got the back, we made some changes, I said there were certain parts I wasn't going to change, submitted again, and it was 45 days the second time. Now, the agency, of course, I gave it to them 30 days before I retired, and then, of course, they wanted to slice the baloney really thin and say, well, we're starting the date over from the date you retire. And their spokesperson went out and said, well, we haven't had it for these days. Well, they had it. They knew, you know, what they were doing. And then they made it very difficult for me to publish. Six former DCIs have published books, 20 former division chiefs, a hundred other officers. Yet when I decided to publish, it was almost, I think most of you have seen the movie Casablanca where the, uh, where Claude Rain says, gambling, I'm shocked there's gambling here. And someone says, you're winning, sir. Uh, that's what it was like. Uh, but I wasn't going to back down. And uh, you know, I had to get an attorney, and I had to file one injunction, and was preparing to file a second injunction when they returned the book back in condition where we could at least publish. I'm going to try to recover additional points that have been redacted there. I'm not. I have no hostility toward my former employer. CIA is a great place to work. It's a great mission. We need to defend our country. We need to defend the Constitution. But you know, the fact is, is CIA briefed Bob Woodward for Bush at war. They briefed. Ghost Wars. If anyone's seen Ghost Wars, there's about 600 pages of classified information in that baby. Uh, but, you know, about my operations too. And, and, and then finally they allowed Gary Schroen to publish a book 
called First In, dedicated a full chapter to me called Calling Me Gary Too. Uh, so I don't want to hear this nonsense about uh, you know, me having violated some trust because I decided to write a book. I'm just not in the mood for it. Well, I think that the new director, Port of Goss, wanted to wants to uh, uh, discourage people from writing. Uh, but you know, I would have thought that the agency had you know I'd worked for the CIA for 23 years. Every any time there was something very very difficult, they sent me. They had my psychological profile. They should have known better. I wasn't backing down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I'd like to follow up on what she asked you before. In your own mind, how do you uh, rationalize the idea that the Army's afraid to send 750 people to go and get bin Laden, who blew up, you know, uh, World Trade Center, but then commits 100,000 people to Iraq? I mean, do you, how do you, how I do you see that, this? I think that at that point in, uh, in the Afghan campaign, I still think that, you know, the shadow of Mo was still hanging over us. And that, you know, this, of course, no one wants to take casualties. We don't want to sacrifice the men and women of our country. But when people attack us here and when we're in a terrible fight, we have to. And I think that there was a bit of that involved in this. It, but it was difficult. It was fast. They needed to, you know, the military likes to get, likes to get in, plan everything perfectly, have four to one advantage when they go in. You don't want to enter into a fair fight or anything that's going to be close. It was very dangerous for me to send that eight men into that province and those four men onto that mountain. They were heavily outnumbered. So, you know, if I could take the risk, uh, you know, others can take the risks as well. And, 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 and the men and women of our armed forces are willing to take those risks. And, and, uh, and then, of course, you know, in Operation Anaconda, they did step up. They did a great job. Unfortunately, took some casualties, but it was a very tough fight down there. Uh, in Iraq, of course, it's a very, very difficult situation we're in. We're losing a lot of people, and it's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Yes, sir. I have a little understanding of dealing with the government and publishing. Is it always a First Amendment violation, a First Amendment fight with the with the uh, federal government on the military level, or are there exclusions to your First Amendment rights? Um, I'm not an attorney, um, <laughs> but in, in this, this was a you know freedom of speech issue here, and you know if, if they're going to brief, if they're going to permit certain agency officers to write things. If they're going to clear those, they have to clear them for me. Yeah. It's just a fun, it was a fundamental first thing. They have right. certain guidelines, and they gave us the guidelines. You can't, you can't reveal you know, active sources and, 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 methods. and methods. But you know, we, as we, as we were writing the book, tried very carefully to adhere to those guidelines. And everything in the book, basically, it all happened in, in before 2001. I mean, it ends in December 2001. It starts in, in, in 1998. And lastly, uh, yeah, just in your opinion, as a military expert, uh, is, it, is it our lack of, of security or their unique ability to gather intelligence that allows Al-Qaeda to continue to uh, you know, attack different points on the globe? You have to understand something. The United States has the, the best intelligence service in the world, but we are covering a planet with 6.5 billion people with a very small clandestine service. I'm not allowed to say how many people there are, but it would be frightening for you to know it how few of us the there are. Okay? <laughs> it would be frightening for you to know how small the number is. That number was reduced in the mid-1990s by 25% which was a huge blow to us. They started the rebuilding in the late 90s, early 2000s, but it was too late. The damage had been done. So that's a problem, and you have to realize, you gotta learn, it takes a long time to learn languages, whether you got Arabic, Chinese, Indonesian, uh, Persian, Pashtun. This is a very big world that we have to cover. During the 1990s, Bin Laden trained more terrorists than we trained FBI agents. So. Question in the back, sir. What should we listen to as citizens to, to educate ourselves? Because I'm, you know, I, I try to go on the web. I try to watch Fox News. I watch. <laughs> it's like, what was the reporting as you know it? And I'm assuming because you know Ralph, you know, you're telling the truth here because I watch the news. I don't know what to believe, and I'm, you know, 
It's, it's kind of confusing as citizens. Because both of us are involved in national security issues yeah, for yeah. years. I, I think it's very <coughs> difficult uh, to, you know, to find out. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of reporting is uh, based on uh, you know, particular sources, and, and the sources might have a, a, an agenda. They might be, uh, you know, advocating a particular policy or point of view. I mean, I think as uh, members of a democracy, it's really, it's our responsibility, you know, to try to find out what's going on in the world, but it's also a huge challenge. And even though there's this huge proliferation of, of information, it, it, I think the challenge is, is harder now, you know, than ever because there's there you never you, it, it, it's very hard to to determine, uh, you, you know, how accurate you know certain information is. I mean, look look at the the last case with the New York Times. I mean, I was reading the stories on the front page of the New York Times about the the mass, the, the weapons of mass destruction in, in, in Iraq, uh, feeling as though well, if the New York Times, a liberal newspaper, was saying this. You know, well, then it probably had some validity, and it turns out that you know Judith Miller was uh, was basically you know uh, being passed information uh, and and and, uh, and and writing it up uh, without attributing where she was getting the information from, and and her sources had you know had a political agenda. So uh, you know, I think it's very difficult. I would say, read the right, read the left, then read the Economist. <laughs> Yes, sir. I'm curious. Um, he, obviously, these things have happened. Most of what we've seen, you know, on the in the press and everything since 2000, 2001. But I mean, is it the current administration really that we should be pointing fingers at? Is this been something that's been ongoing? I mean, you the know, issue, Truman said the buck stops here, but where does it stop? terrorism, specifically on what would. On, on um, what area are you talking about? What problems? I mean, I, I guess uh, you know certainly with everything with Al Qaeda and when was that first? A, we're, when were we aware of that? I mean, is this Republican and Democrat and yeah, everybody? Let me say this: there have been mistakes by both Democrats and Republicans in handling intelligence over the past several decades. Both parties have made terrible mistakes at times. No one's hands are completely clean. Uh, there have been problems on both sides. I think that uh, I think that there are good people on both sides, and they all want to have a safe country, and they want us to advance our interests in the world. Uh, the issue of Al Qaeda was something that that is described very well in a book by Mike Scheuer called "Through the Eyes of Our Enemy: The History, Its Creation, Bin Laden's Involvement First in the Jihad uh, with Mahtad al Khidmat, which was the services organization in Sheikh Azam, a radical Palestinian who was assassinated." and Bin Laden's Ascendance. It's a very good book. Peter Bergen has great books on, he wrote a book recently called The Osama, uh, I Know. So there are some people that have written some good books on Bin Laden. I was not the Bin Laden guy. I worked on Hezbollah, I worked on Shia issues. I did a lot of things in South Asia. So, uh, but I was always the guy that sort of was, you know, like the sixth man on a basketball team, you know, and they wanted somebody to deliver a hard foul or do this or do that, I'd be the guy that sent in, you know. And so, and, you know, or maybe closer to the 10th guy on the team when they wanted a hard foul delivered. But I always got the best playing time uh, and was fortunate that way. But I think that, uh, you know, the whole issue with bin Laden is, is that we did not pay attention and we did not respond. 1996, Kobar Towers, Saudi Arabia. We are bombed, car bo truck bomb, 17 airmen are killed, 400 are injured. We do not respond effectively. And we learned early on who did it. Let me tell you that. We knew early on. It was, con it was concealed that we knew who did it. 1998, and that was the Iranians and Hezbollah that did that. 1998, our embassies are blown up in East Africa. A couple of cruise missiles are fired into, into, the, into Afghanistan. Not a sufficient response. 2000, the coal were attacked. We don't respond again. 11 September was merely in a, in a, uh, one of, in, a mere, in a series of attacks where we don't respond. Bin Laden and his people had been brought to the conclusion that we would not respond to terrorism. When we showed up on the ground in Afghanistan with small teams working with SF, moving around, conducting attacks on the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, they were shocked that we were there. They were shocked. And then they were shocked later as we started killing them all. So, you know, it, but you have to respond to these sorts of things. So, you know, I know there's a lot of criticism for the president in different areas, but 
We need to be responding, and he does respond, where others in this country have not responded for years. George Bush will respond. Yes, sir. Being uh, a person who goes behind enemy lines, what are your thoughts about Alberto Gonzalez's take on uh, doing away with the Geneva Convention as far as regarding the torture? Because that's your guys and you. Yeah, no, let me say this. When I was in Afghanistan, any prisoners that were captured were turned over to the military. We interviewed people at that point. We did no interrogations when I was in Afghanistan. And actually, there was one individual that told a friendly service that they were planning to bomb us in Singapore. And through that interview, we stopped 21 tons of explosives being delivered to the U.S., Israeli, Australian, and British embassies. So, you know, this guy just gave it up, you know. Uh, you know, I'm with McCain on these issues. I, I, I like Senator McCain. I think he's a great man. I like his position on these things. And, uh, you know, I, 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 think that, I think that we have to be, um, you know, I don't think that we should be sending people off to a spa, but, but I'm not in support of torture. No one, I think. I, don't, yeah, I think you have to understand something. CIA officers want to know what the rules are. They want to know. Nobody wants to violate the rules. Nobody wants to read people's mail in the United States. No one's here to turn this into police state. We have a problem. We have a problem because small numbers of people now can leverage technology to create catastrophic effect and attacks. We've got to protect ourselves. So this is the balancing effort. What I would say to the President of the United States is, Mr. President, reach across the aisle. Reach across the aisle. There are good people in this country that will help you. I would say to the Democrats, you've got to help the President, too. This has got to be a shared responsibility of Republicans and Democrats. We need a bipartisan approach to this. Yes, that gentleman in the back. faults with both parties. Do you believe that the executive branch has that much power in the, you know, what's going on with this terrorist organization? Or do you think more of the hierarchies in the CIA and the generals in the military might? Because they're really the ones who give the president and the executive their information. So do you think they might have something to do with the decision making of them? The president gets most of his intelligence from the agency. I mean, he's getting intelligence from the military because they're on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan. But every other part of the world where Al Qaeda is functioning, He's getting his intelligence from the agency. The agency is the primary provider of that intelligence. The military you know, is, 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 is carrying some heavy water in places like in Iraq and Afghanistan and provides intelligence in those battlefields. You know. But for the rest of the world, my concern is in these other places, not just Iraq and Afghanistan. If there's an attack on us, they're not going to, in the domestic part, continental United States, it's not going to be launched from Afghanistan or Iraq. It's going to come from somewhere else in the world, and it's going to be the clandestine service of the CIA working with other countries that's going to help block that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I just wanted to say that this has been going on, the mistakes of the government have been going on for over 30 years, and it's the mistakes of our government that cause these people to act that way. Read Robert Fisk's book, The Conquest of the Middle East. I mean, things that have happened in Iraq, things that happened in Saudi Arabia, things that happened in Iran. These people became angry because of things that we did. Well, I, I, I would say that there's, you know, I, I, I wouldn't accept that position in totality, but I would say that there have been mistakes made in the Middle East by a lot of folks. I would also add to Frumpkin's book, A Peace to End All Peace, is a great book to read. Uh, but I mean, that would we could take all night to debate yeah, the issue just, that you just I stated. Just to say that. Let me get some other one second, sir. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. As the book comes out and you begin to explore and you become um, very public in uh, talking about the book, do you have concerns about your reputation being uh, tainted? No. I told the truth about what occurred. But already happening? Are people no. starting to, you know? No. I told the truth what occurred on the ground. I think that, and, and, and no one has come out and attacked me from either side because they recognize that. I've reported the truth on that. And uh, you know, this was, like I stated, there were mistakes made on all sides. And, and, and the book attempts to point this out. There were good things and bad things with all administrations. But you know, we're in a serious fight here. We need to understand what works, what doesn't work. So it work if we're going in. They're going to harass you. They've done it already. They well, the, 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 it was just a difficulty on the book. The agency's not going to harass me. And, and they don't do that. That's not, it's not what the agency does. They don't have an interest in that. They have an interest in, in defending us from future attacks. That's their focus. 
And, and I would add that, that Gary has a reputation. He, he is one of the most, you know, decorated uh, clandestine officers in, in, in recent history. He stopped something, a couple dozen, you know, bombings against this country and, and the assassination of, of a world leader. And he's arrested, you know, dozens of terrorists. So, you know, he does have a reputation in the CIA and, and people there, you know, hold him in very high esteem, even though they didn't want him to write this book. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Well, we have the book now, but we don't have you out there. So were you, which was also valuable, um, were you ready to come home and be finished? Because we've also launched you out there now. There are a lot of other people that are good officers. There are other men and women in the field who have been doing this, people I've trained, worked with closely over the years. Um, I'm going to write other books. I'm going to do policy things, and at one point I hope to go back to government, but not as an operations officer. Did something happen recently where there was a because we sort of missed our target? Yeah, in Pakistan over the weekend there was an airstrike there, and actually I've had s several news organizations have asked me to, to comment on that. What I would say is, yes, there was an incident. I don't think that people have all the information right now of exactly what occurred, but let me say this. Before an airstrike would be done, they would be collecting intelligence from human, technical, you know, overhead, sig and signals intelligence. They would be doing from many, many sources before they would pull the trigger to fire a missile. I can assure you, because I've been involved in this process. We are very, very careful about this. Now, was Zawahiri present? I'm not sure they know yet. Were other people in that meeting possible lieutenants of his? Possibly. So I think that, that people, you know, quickly are stating, oh, it's a terrible mistake. The only way we're going to get these guys is to be aggressive about this. But we really go to great lengths to try to avoid civilian casualties. And frequently we will not act on something because we're afraid we're going to hurt innocent civilians. I've been in situations where I had information of people inside a location. I could have attacked the thing. There were houses too close. I figured there were children in there, and I said, no, we're not going to go after this facility. We're going to wait, and we're going to go after them somewhere else. I've done that. And, you know, but it's, it's a balancing act. It's hard because you're, you're worried. You don't want to injure them, but then you don't want a situation where someone escapes and then kills some of your men. So it's, it's a hard thing because we're, we're concerned. The U.S. government's concerned. People in DOD, the Department of Defense, and people in the agency are, are so concerned about that that in the book, I talk about a chapter, and I think a lot of people would be surprised. Our people are in a fight down in, in Tora Bora, and our men see a, a tank, and they put a laser on the tank, but then the tank goes behind a mountain ridge. They call the plane, and they say, attack that tank, and the pilot says, I cannot attack the tank. You don't have the laser on it, and the rules of engagement say, I only attack what you can see and light up. Now the, so actually, I had to call back. I had to get the Pentagon to change the rules of engagement before they would just could destroy that tank a day later. And that tank presented a threat because it could have identified our people in the mountains and started firing shells at them. So that's how, how strict the rules are followed on this because it was a concern of ensuring that we do not have civilian casualties at, at incredible cost. Yeah. There, there's another incident in the book where where they're tracking uh, the, the same gentleman that they were that they that they tried to get in Pakistan, Zawahiri, and uh, Zawahiri, and uh, uh, he 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 was visiting a hospital with his wife, and they decide that uh, you know the circum it was too dangerous. That was me. I decided, yeah. yeah. And that was Gary who decides uh, it's it's too dangerous to attack him there. So so you can see in the book you know instances of uh, of where. You know, they're tracking these people, they know where they are, but they decide not to take a shot at them because they're afraid of, of, of civilian casualties and, and, and hoping that, you know, they'll find the guy out in the open somewhere, somewhere else, and, and, uh, and have a shot at him. So does this mean we get a little desperate? Excuse me? What does this mean? What just happened and we get a little desperate? No, we're not desperate, but, but Al-Qaeda presents a strategic threat to the United States. They've stated openly that they are willing to use weapons of mass destruction against us. Based on that statement, we have to take them seriously, take them at their word, and we're going to have to either capture or kill their leaders. It's that simple. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. One second. Based on what you, based on what you know, and, and 
what you've been able to discern from your you know, colleagues, former colleagues. What's your best estimate as to where bin Laden may be now? Would it be Waziristan? I think that you're correct. It's going to be along the Afghan-Pak border. There are 25 million Patans that live there. It's a tribal group that, that as part of their code for living, doesn't, will not turn in people that have sought refuge. Bin Laden worked among those people during the Soviet Jihad. So you're talking from the early 80s, he's been in there, working with these people, building hospitals, schools, doing all sorts of developmental work. They like him, they support him, came back later. So this is where he's hiding among these people. And the, the government of Pakistan does not have full control over that area. That's why they call it the Northwest Frontier Province. It's worse than the Wild West. Militias, fortresses, you know, private armies. It's a perfect place for him to be. What's the solution to, to that problem? If there is one. Continued collection of intel, identification of a location, and then finally when you've got it nailed down, then you have to make some tough decisions about how you go after them and how you're going to do this. Last week they tried with missile attacks. So they may have to insert a team? We, uh, it would be a, it, you have to be very, very careful because you don't want to destabilize Pakistan because Pakistan has nuclear weapons. That's a, a complicating factor. Yes, sir. about the situation we have in Iran? Um, the Iranians are a country that has that figured out early on that terrorism is a successful form of foreign policy. They have been supporting attacks on people around the world since the revolution. They have participated in savage murders and attacks. Hands down, this is it. This is what this is what they are, and you know they can um, dress themselves up. They can speak flowerly language at the United Nations. It doesn't change who and what they are. They will, they, uh, I really believe that the Ministry of Intelligence and Security, the Intelligence Service of Iran, are modern day, they're Middle Eastern Nazis. That's what they are. They will kill and torture you. They will do whatever they need to win and whatever they can to advance their interests. It is a real problem for, for, for the, the Iranian Intelligence Service and what they've done over the years. And their government has used them against foreigners, they're using them against their own citizens. It's, it's not all Iranian citizens, yeah, not all Iranians are like this. Their security services are, 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 are among the worst in the world. There are Iranians, though, in that country that would like freedom. They like to change things, and it's, it's, it's going to be tough for them, very tough for them. Yes, sir. This was on man to man combat basis. We've never fought an army like this before. We've never fought a war like what, this. What, Al Qaeda? Uh, you mean Al Qaeda? I mean, oh. we're talking about. 30 years of pissing people off, as she stated, doesn't make a guy strap dynamite in, walk into a bar in Israel and blow people up. Doesn't create that. You know, these people believe in jihad, and they believe in something that we're not used to dealing with. And martyrism is what it's all about. And, and, and as much as I, as, as, as I, as I believe in your speech, and I love what you're doing, I have just my, my question is, how do we not give Osama bin Laden exactly what he wants? International press and coverage. How do we make him unimportant and just gather intelligence, A, and B, how do we cut off his money sources? How do we cut off all kind of money sources? We, we, we tracked his personal <coughs> sources and cut a lot of them off. But if we cut the money off, you know, we might be able to cut some of the fighting off. Another couple of questions there. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, First off, um, I think that it's too far gone to sort of make him unimportant. You know, we would have had to deal with him a long time ago to make him unimportant. He is the leader of this group and of Islamic uh, extremists worldwide. We have to recognize now what's happening, and I've said this in other interviews, is not a clash of civilizations between the West and Islam. What is happening is a clash within Islam between those that believe that Islam can coexist with secular democracy and those in Islam that want a religious state like the Taliban, like 15th style, 15th century style Islam. There's a battle going on there. We fundamentalists. So we have decided to support those or to work with those that are involved in secular democracy. Some of them are, are not Democrats. Some of them are, have authoritarian regimes and it's distasteful for us, but this is all we've got at the moment. So this is the fight that's going on there. We, we, we're not, we can't make Bin Laden unimportant. We just have to defeat him at this point, unfortunately. But in general? 
do we give the monitors what they want? We're going to have to give him. Uh, I mean, I was tempting uh, with all I could to sort of, you know, let him meet his maker. You know, the, you know, the, he wanted martyr, and we were going to try to give it to him, uh, uh, and, 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 and failed at that point. You know, we were trying, uh, but uh, you know, it's it's that's all we can do on, on that on that point. Now, your second question was, um, let me think for a second what the question was. Cutting uh, off the cutting off finance. I think that we've worked on the finance. I think that's being worked. But you have to understand something. Bin Laden's family, Mohammed bin Laden, was the single wealthiest man in Saudi Arabia, Arabia outside the royal family. Twenty years ago, the, the, the government was out of money in Saudi Arabia. He paid the salaries of family members for six months. I mean, the salaries of government employees for six months there. That's how much money he had. So there's a lot of cash. So, you know, there's money. Bin Laden also, after the Afghan Jihad, resettled thousands of those Afghan fighters back in Saudi Arabia. So there's a lot of middle class businessmen there in different cities that were helped by bin Laden. He's got thousands of supporters, thousands. So it's not just cutting off transactions. People can carry cash to them. They can do all sorts of, you're not going to cut them off money. We just have to, we, ha we have to go after him. This is a very tough thing we're involved in. We are going to be involved in fighting extremism for the next two decades. This is not going to end. And any discussion about, well, we're going to leave Iraq and we're going to produce our forces and things will be better, no doesn't matter. There are people who have decided that they don't like us in the Middle East, any part of the Middle East, but the world is too small and interconnected. We cannot withdraw from it. So we're going to have to fight them where we have, you know, where, where they are at, at points. We're going to have to do economic development. We're going to have to help people. We're going to have to do positive things in the Middle East. We're going to have to get our message out there. This is something that has to be fought. Not just, it's not just counterterrorism policy. We need better policy in general you know, across a whole number of areas. It's not, counterterrorism policy shouldn't be the thing that just stands alone. It's got to be part of larger policy of how the United States conducts itself in the Middle East and in the world. Yes, sir. My question would be, how government needs to empower us as citizens to, to, to think differently? And, and what are we doing to learn what, you know, I'm an educated guy, I, I think, I went to college. I have no idea what life is like in Saudi Arabia or Iran. And, you know, I, and I applaud you for doing this because this is, a, you know, it, we need more people like you to step up and start saying, look, it, this war on terror is not going to be won. Yeah. As I see I think it, at least, more, you know, I, I may be dead. It. it shouldn't be called the global war on terrorism. It should be the struggle against violent extremism. I mean, that's really what we should be calling this thing. You know, if you, have, you say the war, well, it's like you can win the war. Well, you know, the point is, is that this is going to be with us a long, long time. We all have to recognize that. And, and that, that 11 September was the first chapter in a struggle which may take a long time. We have to be in this for the long haul, unfortunately. Yes, ma'am. How do you speak to the criticism, the, the extreme criticism in our country that this is an oil conflict, that Bush is in bed with the Al Qaeda's, that they've always been, and that this yeah, is evil, yeah. and it's, 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 ridiculous. it's about money? It's not. But the United States had control of the oil fields when we invaded Iraq the first time, you know, during the Kuwait, when we kicked them out of Kuwait. We had the oil fields. We gave them back. It's not about oil. It's not about oil, regardless of maybe what some movies might say. It's not about oil. It's, it's, it's about other things. And they decided to declare war on us because we are a global power. We are the preeminent power in the world. We're not perfect. We make mistakes, too. Uh, and, uh, you know, serious mistakes at times. Uh, but uh, I think that, you know, we have, to, we have to try to have an America that's a force for good in the world. I think a lot of us believe that. I don't see the president's, I think that some people are just crazy in their, their criticisms of the president's. The administ this administration's made some mistakes. They've done some good things, too. Uh, but, but the point is, is that, that it's just not one-sided. You know, it's just not all this insanity, you know, that, that some people are spewing about the president being evil and that his, this all being some huge conspiracy about oil. That's not correct. Yes, sir. Excuse me? What are the other things it's about? What are the what other are things that it's about? about? I think that the issues, you know, regarding the Middle East and about, well, first off, it's about inequity in the Middle East, terrible inequity. Yeah. Oil is a curse it, it, it's, it's about inequity. It's about the fact that in the early part of this century, the people that are suffering there from poverty have looked to religion as, as, as that thing that they would turn to in their struggles and, that, and that, that there is a conflict. I think that the person who really describes all this so well is Thomas Friedman. 
I think when you read the Lexus and the Olive Tree, I think that is the most important book I've read in maybe my life in understanding the world as it is right now. I'd like to thank Mr. Freeman for writing that. It's wonderful. And it's and that's that's the that the, the, the problem here is this struggle between the old and the new and and poverty and all these other issues. And you know, he talks about a lot of things in that book and I think that's something that's very helpful. You want to make a comment on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's a, you know, there's a, there's a huge, okay. you know, social component, you know, to this, uh, especially in the Middle East and in all the developing world. And uh, and and you, these are these governments are very bad at distributing resources, you know, throughout their society. You know, I think that's something that most Americans don't understand very well. I mean, yeah. Saudi Arabia, and Iran, you know, these countries are making, you know, billions and billions of dollars a year you know, from, from selling oil to the West. But very, very little of it is, 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 is spent in their countries in, in, uh, in development and, in, you know, reaching, you know, you know, poor people. And as Gary pointed out, you know, these people in their, the poor in their frustration, you know, turns to religious fundamentalism as, a, as an answer, saying, you know, you know, why am I still, why are my kids still dying? Why can't I get an education and so on? And they turn to the, you know, to Bulas who, uh, who say, you know, oh, I've got the answer. And uh, it's very unfortunate. That's why, you know, really the, 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 the you know, getting these, 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 these governments to be more responsive, to be, to more, to be more representative, you know, is, is the ultimate answer. But, you know, that's a very difficult and long-term process. Um. That'll be it for, for the evening. I'd just like to, to finish by thanking all of you for coming tonight, for the really great questions that we've received. I look forward to talking to all of you uh, afterwards when we have, some, have a drink together. Gary Bernson was an officer in the clandestine service for 20 years and was awarded both the Distinguished Intelligence Medal and the Intelligence Star. Jawbreaker is published by Crown. Visit crownpublishing.com for more information.